Yes, let's just get started. So, thank you for showing up. I hope you know this uh, presentation is about Drupal performance from a, from a beginner level. Uh, unfortunately, the word performance got dropped from the from the, uh, the program. So, if you're thinking this is about anything else, now is the, the time to leave. So, my name is Paul Christian. Uh, I'm Dutch. Uh, I live in Harlem, together with Nancy. My second biggest fan, I hear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, my job title is that I'm a customer success engineer at Acquia. Hardly anybody knows what that means. I'm still finding out myself, but I describe it as such that I help all new enterprise sites land on our, the Acquia Cloud Platform as smoothly as possible. So from the time people sign the contract with Acquia till they launch, a little bit after that, I take care of them on a technical level. I help them with some you know, best practices on performance or security or all kinds of other things technical and make sure they're successful on Acquia Cloud. Yeah. They, they kindly provide me the time and money to be here today and they're also sponsoring this event. So. I hope you visit us at our booth, we have some nice swag there. Um, on Drupal.org I go by this name, S-Q-Y-D. I pronounce it as Skid. Feel free to butcher that in any way you feel fit. Um, I also go by the same name in Twitter. That's about all the social media I do. I don't do Facebook and many other things. So, uh, But Google me and you probably find me. Uh, my claim to fame is that I'm the original author of the Porridge module for Drupal. So if you were using Varnish, there was a Varnish module and that interacted with Drupal with Varnish directly over the Varnish administration socket. If your security guy or network guy couldn't make that work, this was the alternative module. Um, I've done the Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 versions of that. Uh, I'm actually not a really big, good programmer, so the Drupal 8 version I've left to a colleague of mine called Niels, and he's, he's gracefully taking that over and up to the next level for Drupal 8. I'll tell about a little bit more about that. So, I'm, I wrote this presentation for beginners. That's how it was announced in the program as well. I still think that at least in my experience, at least some of these topics are missed by some of the more experienced Drupalists as well. Uh, performance is usually not the first focus what people think about when they're building Drupal. They want to build functionality. Um, so performance can, is probably not in the front of your mind when you're building a Drupal site. That's why I hope to educate a few things uh, here today on Drupal performance. On a basic level, I'm not going to give you the nitty-gritty on how to do exactly this module configuration on how to do Varnish VCL for Drupal 5.1, whatever. That, that's, that's not the focus of it. If you have any questions about that, feel free to come approach me anytime during this conference. I'm here for you. Um, so why performance matters? Um, the most prominent aspect is the human behavior aspect, right? People are impatient. So if your site takes too long to load, at least in the perception of the visitor of that site, people go elsewhere, people lose interest, people find that other 22 tabs on their browser that they find more interesting, and you've lost them. And if your, your site depends on, on, on visitors for being successful, or your business depends on it, that, that's not what you like. So investing already in, 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 in performance for that reason alone can help you. Then again, Google likes fast websites too. They will rank your site higher in, in Google index if it performs faster. So search engine optimization is another reason why performance really matters. Um, then also, if the application you build in Drupal performs really bad and it's going to cost you a lot of server capacity to make it work at all, you're going to spend a considerable amount of money sizing those servers and, and spending money on, on infrastructure that you could have spent elsewhere. So, one other more. And since, you know, if you're saving infrastructure, if you're saving your bandwidth bill, if you're saving your electricity bill, you know, you help the environment. You know, insert your favorite cute animal here, and they will be happy as well. So, when to start thinking about performance? Start now. Start even before you start developing things. I see too many cases 
where web performance is an afterthought. Oh yeah, yeah, we built this awesome website, it looks great, client is happy because we demoed it locally and it works great, and then the first 10 visitors hit it and performance dropped to a standstill. And just after lunch is not really a good time to start caring about performance because then, you know, Google is already looking at your website. Your most interested clients and visitors are scanning the website and making up an opinion. That's not when you want to give them that impression that your site is slow, slow as hell and, you know, keep them waiting for those next pages or those next interactions. So, I would recommend start measuring right away. Even when you just hit the last submit on your Drupal uh, installation script, install PHP, see what, how long it takes to load, log in and load that first website and see that as a benchmark. You're only going to make things worse after that. So let's at least see how on your infrastructure on how, you, how your code base performs from an early stage and keep measuring that so at least you know when that's degrading and it's probably related to one of your last few changes. So if you just measure something really low, hey, what did we do yesterday? Oh, we built this enormous form that we were already testing now as well. Maybe there's something to be cached in that form or some optimization you can do there. Or at least, if it's something that you accept, then at least you know when, what happened, and that, you know, you may even want to talk to your client and say, yeah, we probably want to lose this feature because it's really taking the site performance down. Early in the process, that's hard to do when you're done, right? So, start early. Um, so what is fast? How do you measure that? Um, just click around your site. You as a human already have some, some experience with the web, I hope, by the time you build your Drupal site. So you will already know when something is slow, right? Use your own instinct and your own gut feeling if you think something is slow or not. Because you're probably really right, right? And we as web developers, we have amazingly fast laptops. At least mine is pretty old, but it's still fast. You know, Moore's law is dead anyway, so. Um, Use that as at least your gut feeling. <laughs> then use your client, demo him an early version of the site and see and ask him straightforward, what do you think about this, this site performance? Because you can measure all the milliseconds and all the, 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 the stopwatch you know, the software that's out there, but if you as a human or your client is going to pay you to build this, or he thinks it's slow, you can measure all you want, but at least something that you need to fix there. So start with that. And trust that. Then again, it's, it still helps if you can have some more and more science, scientific approach to your measurement. So, um, I use, I'm, I'm mentioning a couple of tools that you can use to do that. There's literally hundreds of them out there. Uh, I'm quite old fashioned. I still use Firebug, which is a kind of antiquated browser built, you know, extension, but it has everything that I need and I've been using it for over a decade. So. Um, use that, but at least that will show you a timeline of, okay, this is when we requested the first page, and this is how long it took to render that, get all the assets in, and, and this is when the site is done. It will tell you up to the millisecond how long that takes for that request. Um, why slow is a nice plugin for a firebug that also will give you more uh, explanation and recommendation on how to fix some of your you know, basic performance needs when it comes to uh, uh, website performance. It's not Drupal specific, but most of the things that I mentioned apply to Drupal just as well as on any other site. Um, have a look at your server log. How, how many sites did you process in one hour or in one, and, and how much performance did, did do those do, they, do those do those logs have in them? Um, I'm a big fan of New Relic. It's a cloud-based uh, performance tool, and it really integrates nicely with Drupal. Um, so we have a Drupal module out there. You can install a little agent on your server, and it will literally provide you with loads and loads of really significant performance-related data. They have free startup plans and demos that you can try for a few weeks, and then still basic monitoring is still for free with these guys. So I highly recommend you check them out. It's really pretty as well. 
So it's something that you can even have your client have a guest login so they can have something to click around with and be proud of all the color graphs that are out there, client like color graphs. You know that, right? So use that as well. If you want to do it yourself, want to go more deeper, Xdebug is one that we use a lot at Acquia as well. Um, it's similarly detailed, not really Drupal specific, but if you want to drill down on which PHP function or database query or whatever got you in trouble, it, 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 you can find that in Xdebug as well. And like I said, there's hundreds of out there. Take whatever tool you like or your colleague recommends or a, a blog post you read somewhere. I uh, recommend you. Then, how much performance do you really need? Assuming that there are going to be more than one person visiting your website, right? So, even if you measure something in your local browser, that's just one visitor on a really powerful machine that's probably faster than the server you're running out, or at least the shared server that gets sold to you as a, as a VPS, right? So. How many visitors will hit your website? Um, try to have a reasonable estimate on what is your peak traffic. Um, if we ask about peak traffic to clients, many times we hear, yeah, every month we have about this many thousands of visitors. That's really not the metric you're looking for if you're looking for peak performance, right? We don't want to know the average. We want to know what is the peak, how many Visitors are on the site at the same time at which minute, minute right? At, at that very minute. Because that is the peak capacity that your server will have to have, be able to take on the load that you're sending to it. Right? So force your client to come up with better metrics. Or monitor it. What you know. Usually, sometimes even the client itself or the development team that is working with the client doesn't know. But I'm sure that if they have ad advertisement on it, they know exactly when they sell most ads. That's a good metric to look for. It will tell you something. Right? When it comes to server performance and, and resources, memory is, is, is usually the, the most limiting factor. So, at least in my experience, unless your site is doing really heavy computation, so if you're resizing videos on the fly, encoding them in three, three different formats, yeah, CPU is, is, is your concern. But in my experience, at least most Drupal sites that I see, memory is a limiting factor. So the more memory you can have available, the more concurrent PHP processes you can handle, the more visitors you can at least have bootstrap Drupal fully, have a bird shaved the page shares, and then have that uh, be delivered to the visitor. So at least you can help the next one right? as soon as possible. Um, so calculate the limits of how much memory do you have. Um, most PHP instances, service, or if you install a PHP engine on your, on your local environment on a web server, it will probably reserve 128 megabyte for each session. Uh, sometimes lower, sometimes more. Depends on where you go. We, uh, we at Acquia have the 128. Um, so if you then at least try to protect your server by limiting the amount of PHP processes you can handle by calculating how much of those memory you need, um, you can at least make sure that your server is not demanded you know, too much of. Uh, and make sure that you have memory to serve each of those users. And if then the next person ends up asking something that is no longer available, which is the next PHP process, then at least it can be queued or just said, no, sorry, we're too busy. But at least your server will stay up and running. Um, so restrict that memory to what you can. If I, sometimes I literally get requests, please increase the memory limit to two gigabyte, because I get these nasty errors. If you do that, you will really literally limit the amount of, of, of PHP processes from the default of 128 by 16-fold. I'm really bad at calculus. Somebody can probably check that. But that means you, the number of users that you can help is really reduced. So see what kind of server you have. See how much processes you can fit in that memory and limit it to what you have there. Right? Um, then 
if you're testing things, if you, if you overload a system, that server will end up in trouble. Um, some system will have something like a swap file, so if you ask more memory than there's physical memory available, it starts to replace really fast RAM memory with really slow disk memory. Uh, that, that mechanism is called swap, both in Windows and in Linux. Don't try to avoid that whatever you can. It's, it's sort of a safeguard, so in a way it seems better than just bringing down the server or getting an out-of-memory issue. Um, you're in trouble anyway, so we at Acura, we even disable swap. And if you overbook it, we limit what we can to make sure you don't end up in that out-of-memory issue, but um, if you are in an out-of-memory, yeah, your server is toasted and you need to restart it. That, that, that's the way out of that. So whatever you do, don't kill servers. They have feelings too. Or at least the poor bastard who has to help you restart it. Yes. So, planning. Um, just like this, there's no use to see when you can, if you can break a server, or if you can throw as much traffic to a server that, 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 that it will collapse under the load. There, there's no use for that. I, I sometimes see people that say, do really hasty load tests, and they just send 2,000 requests uncached to a server that only has a capacity for maybe 100. Uh, yeah, you broke the server. Well, what else did you learn? Not too much. So, try to see, you know, you just did some calculus, you know what peak capacity do you need. Try to make your test at least a representation of that and, 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 and learn from that and see, okay, can, can I handle that scenario? How much peak capacity do I have? Oh, I know that I've made some calculus and I said, well, I should be able to have 150% of my peak that I know, which is a nice margin to have. Okay, test for that. Go a little bit over, see if the server you know, can handle a little more than it's supposed to do. Sure, that, that can be really educational. Uh, but either doing way too much or too slow. You, don't, you, know, you can still test your application on your local server and with one request. It doesn't really learn you. You really learn a lot by sending at least a few parallel requests and see how, how your application handles that. If there's any bottleneck, you probably will find it with about 25 users, is my opinion. Some people think otherwise. What's really important to distinguish is, is how many people log into your site. As, as I will talk about later, there's a big difference between people who are authenticated against Drupal and pages that we can cache and then reuse for any other anonymous user requesting the exact same information. Um, so make sure that at least if you have a login feature for your site um, where visitors can log in or at least interact with a way, you know, maybe you have a form there that's uncashable as well. So how many of your, your visitors will actually hit Drupal on each and every request? Make sure you have the percentage and, and commit to that because that will really depend on how much server capacity you need. Um, and again, you know, be in time. Don't, don't do this two days before launch. Sometimes, you know, literally we, we see clients finding perf critical performance issues two or three days before launch. Yeah, we just tested the site for the first time after a half a year of development, and now we need to postpone our launch. And it really happens a lot, you'd be amazed. So start early. Do a little test now and then, and, and make sure you don't have any surprises in the end. Right? So. There's a zillion tools to load test. Uh, the easiest one is your F5 button on your keyboard, which is reload in browsers. Uh, start with that still, you know, what happens if I hit F5? It's really fast. Then you're probably getting something served from cache. That's really good, right? If it's really slow, something's wrong already. You're going to find that same if you send 100 users or 2,000 users to that same site. So better fix it early. Um, some people are really nice with scripts and know all the command line options of that tool called curl. If you can do that, if you know a little bit of scripting, write your own. I, I still find that's usually more educational and more useful 
uh, then hitting all of the ready-made tools. I'm going to mention a few anyway. Uh, Apache Benchmark, it's quite primitive, but what it can do is at least ramp up uh, really nice and slow, so you at least know when something breaks and have it react to that or log that really nicely. Uh, AB is the command. Uh, should be on, on most Linux distributions. Um, JMeter is really advanced, right? It's a Java application, it's open source. Um, if you have a workflow that really depends on a login and then a complex conf uh, a commerce uh, form or anything that really depends on cookies or, or state, you can probably program that in a really advanced JMeter uh, script. So if you're doing something that is really not so easy to build in a, in a simple script or by just hitting the top five URLs that, that your marketer says are your top five URLs. Uh, JMeter is probably where you want to look. It's quite complicated. You can make things really easy, but you can make things insanely advanced as well. Um, if you don't want to run it yourself, BlazeMeter is a tool we recommend a lot at Acquia. It's a hosted version of JMeter, so you don't need to worry about all the Java crap and just have it hosted in the cloud. They even have a free offering, so register and point to your website, see what happens. It's quite educational. And you're still going to upload your advanced JMeter scripts to this cloud, right? And say, okay, and now one of them. If you pay them, you can really send a few thousand people, or at least virtual people, to your site and see what happens now. So, after you've done that, you've probably have an idea where your bottleneck is. Is it authenticated users? Is it network capacity? Is it, you know, so, so what, what can we do to, to fix things? Um, this is a quote that I remember a Dutch Drupalist telling me that back in 2008. He showed me a really early version of views for Drupal 1 and he roughly translated said, like anything in Drupal, it's painfully slow until you turn on caching. And that applies for, for views in Drupal 5, 6, and even in 8, and anything in IT, basically. So if you look at your machine, even in your phone, there's like at least three or four layers of caching everywhere, and every component and every IT solution out there. Realize that. If, if we didn't have the concept of caching, we'd all be out of a job, really. <laughs> right? Or at least paying a lot more money to you know, the, the, the server infrastructure providers uh, uh, that we all rely on. So there's CPU caches, disk caches, all these kinds of caches. One of them is not a cache. Find it. It's the most fun one. Um, so in Drupal, we have a lot of layers of caching as well. We have block caches, menu caches, page caches. We have really advanced cache solutions like BigPipe. It's still experimental. But if you have a mix of content that is served to anonymous users and authenticated users, you really want to check it out because that really efficiently combines those two in a cacheable, at least as much cache as much as we can, and sort of last minute deliver anything that's personalized on the website. It's really nice. My colleague Wayne Lewis uh, uh, built that together with uh, uh, Fabian, who works at one of those other tech one. Uh, uh, consultancy firms, really great guys, and, uh, and there's in DrupalCon Barcelona they presented on this. So if you're interested in doing advanced things on, on mixing those those variations of caching, check that presentation out. Um, many people still should be realized views and panels and many other more advanced module solutions out in Drupal have their own caching layer. So even though your site may be personalized because of a few blocks here and there that have a shopping cart or a hello user with their name on it or whatever. If the view that you're presenting in that page can be cached, turn on caching, it's, on, it's a little hidden in the corner under advanced, but every view should be able to at least have a cacheable solution and it will try to reuse whatever it has. You can even separately set parameters on how long to cache the complete render view, or even do just a query. So if you want to change some rendering later on or that changes, you can have separate parameters for that. Highly recommend you check it out, play around with it a little. It can really save a lot of performance on your site. 
Uh, just one thing to mention, in Drupal 6 and 7, and even before that, we used incorrectly said form, use uh, the term form cache. The form cache table and the form cache missing is not a cache. Right? It's, it's, it's a state engine. It happens to use the same mechanism as the cache system that we have, which was a bad choice. So it's different in Drupal 8. But take care of that. So where to store caches? Um, in Drupal, you can, by default, we can do it in a database because that's, that's the storage engine that we have available any, any way if you use Drupal, right? Um, sometimes it really can help you if, if your performance sees a bottleneck in the database or you see a lot of more activities in those cache tables in the database, using a separate store for your caches can be really useful. At Acquia, we use Memcache. Uh, I'm sure you heard of it, it's a technology coming from Facebook. Um, it's not really secure by itself, so you need to take care and secure that. Ask your hosting provider if you can help you with that. Of course, we have it at, at Acquia. Uh, some of our competitors prefer Redis. It's a different solution out there. I'm honestly not so familiar with it, but I see it's being used uh, quite widely as well. Um, MongoDB is another of the usual suspects. And it's, it's sort of died down, but like every two months, a new, uh, somebody new wrote a new NoSQL backend. So there are probably going to be quite a few more. It's still a, a, a field that is in motion quite a lot. So if you see this presentation in three years from now, there's probably other ones that you want to check out. The good thing about Drupal is that, hey, there's a module for that. So by the time that an emerging new technology comes out, somebody already wrote a module for you, and you can just build on that. Right? So keep an eye on those. External caches. So what happens outside of Drupal? Uh, the cache that everybody gets for free is your browser cache. Many people still frown upon it. Oh, I hate browser caches and they have some extension that turns it off because developing with a cache is irritating, right? Because you almost always need to invalidate it or clear it or whatever it's called. Um, I encourage you to at least learn how your browser cache works. I'm not going to explain that here. There's all kinds of articles out there. Google for it. I recommend you to at least understand you know, what happens if a browser thinks it has something in cache that it can reuse, how it verifies this, and how you can make best use of those mechanisms already in place for free. You don't need to do nothing about it. And Drupal plays really nice with those by default. So if you go to the performance setting in Drupal, you can set an, a time that something will remain in cache. It's off by default, but we always recommend that we put at least five minutes in there. Um, then again, we sometimes are now able to convince clients to extend that to a week or a month even. I'll go into that a little later, but you know, the better you do it, the least chance a browser or you know, a reverse proxy needs to come back and, and refetch and regenerate the same response. Uh, the better it is for your overall performance. Um, reverse proxy caches are literally systems that stand between the visitor and the web server. Um, the most popular one is Varnish Cache. There's quite a few others out there, uh, but I'm a big Varnish fan, as some people may know. So um, check that out. It's, it should be quite straightforward. Most of these engines really try to re follow all the, the, the rules about caching in the HTTP server the protocol and make sure that we bother Drupal as least as possible by asking them the same for, so, for the same response every time. So if an anonymous visitor hits any URL, your homepage or any other URL, and it sees it has a valid response to that already generated for another one, it will just serve it right from the varnish cache model, the memory and make sure that we don't even hit Drupal, avoiding all kinds of relatively slow Drupal bootstraps who need, then need to hit database caches, who then need to hopefully a memory cache, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a cache memory storage or anything like that. So um, again, it's at least something that you should, if you care about performance and you have something that you massively scale, learn a little about them. Get to, I still see clients who are really great at PHP and web development and don't care too much about servers. 
you don't need to run your own varnish instance. Your hosting provider should probably take care of that for you. But at least familiarize yourself with the mechanisms. I, I still sometimes see people who literally have a little trick that adds some random noise to each URL. And we ask them, why are you doing that? You're killing your cache rates, user, right? Why are you doing that? Yeah, yeah, we don't like varnish. It's always in our way. We are a real-time company, and if we change something, we want to see it outside, so varnish is more in our way. Okay, um, try not to do that, because it's, it's really, and try to spend a little time educating yourself on what that varnish cache or that reverse proxy cache or any other kind is doing for you, because it should be helping you. And there's quite a few ways that you can use, you know, optimize that and make sure you don't get hit by that problem that you perceive to be having, right? Um, a CDN, Content Delivery Network, is literally that same reverse proxy cache that's sent between the visitor and your Drupal instance, but then on a global level. You just go to a company that has a whole bunch of these systems all over the world, and they literally try to be close to your visitor as well. So they may have a data presence here in the UK, and then one in the US, and maybe even one inside of this firewall in China, which gets complicated, I won't go into that, but there's people who do that. And, and make sure that if you're a global brand, you know, you don't have to go all the way around the world to get that response. No, it's already coming from a cache in your neighborhood, probably in your ISP network. So, I'm a big fan of Fastly. Why? They use Varnish Cache as a CDN. I know a few people work there, so, so I always mention them first. Uh, Akamai was earlier to the market. Uh, they are the biggest one, so they literally have points of presence in nearly all ISP networks and all over the world. So I used to work on a KPN, at KPN, uh, a Dutch ISP, and they literally had an Akamai island in their hosting environment. And so if you hit anything that's coming from their content delivery network, you don't even need, need the ISP network. So it's really efficient. You pay for that. So another nice option is Cloudflare. They're quite cheap. They even have free options. Uh, so. Nice, I recommend you just play around. Go to Cloudflare, register, and see what happens to your personal blog if you feel it's improved, right? And just point DNS to it. You should be able to have some nice performance gain for free. And there's hundreds out there, so uh, this is the ones I know, and there are more. Like I said, cache as long as possible. I already mentioned that. Uh, there is something really advanced. It's called ESI, Edge Site Include, where you can either tell a varnish instance or your CDN. It's actually a technology uh, first implemented uh, by Yahoo, but Akamai was the first CDN to implement it as well, where you actually assemble components of your website on the CDN level, so not in Drupal, but say, okay, let's send out a response to a cache, make sure it gets stored in all those caches all over the world, and then for a little block that's personalized or maybe regionally independent, let's inject that on the, on the cache level. Uh, be careful, because I've seen people who think they understand. I always think this is one of those mechanisms. The shorter you think about it, the greater it sounds. So I've seen an implementation of a newspaper that actually managed to have five components being injected in this method that I just explained. So for each page view, they bootstrap Drupal five times, and that's slow. Then you're probably better off just assembling your site in Drupal. Okay. So there's a module for ESI for Drupal 7 and 8, I think even for 6. Um, be careful what you're doing there. Make sure you have some good measurements. If you followed all the other things that I recommended you, you're probably okay, but still. Um, so how do we manage to get clients to extend their, their expiration time for their caches to up to a month um, by making sure that if something changes, we eliminate that from their caches. So the term you use, see used for that is purge. Uh, that's the little module that I wrote that in, you know, interacts between Drupal and, and a varnish instance or CDN that supports Drupal as well. There are quite a few options for Drupal 7. Right, so there's a varnish module that only talks to varnish over the varnish protocol. 
um, you have Perch that does things over HTTP, it can do Nginx, Varnish, and quite a few others. And there's quite a few platform specific. So for most of those CDNs that I just mentioned, there is a Perch module. So if you have Akamai Perch, Cloudflare Perch, Podly Perch, whatever Perch. Um, for Drupal 8, we have now sort of have a trend that we really try to have one generic Perch module that allows plugins, really quite advanced Drupal 8 stuff, but hey, if you just install that module and click enable it, you can really easily make sure that you take the best advantage of this really advanced Drupal 8 mechanism that we have, it's called tag-based purging. So what happens, I'm, I'm going to point you to Wim Leers again, who implemented this for Drupal, but it's already in Drupal core, and the purge module uses for this, is used for this. Um, each response that Drupal gives out, it adds a header that contains unique identifiers for all of the components that are used on that site. So it's this block, it's that view, it's this header, it's this image, it's this node, it's this list of nodes. And it will squeeze all of those identifiers in a, in a tag header. Then, we, if one of those things changes, we can find, hey, this is the tag that we use for this component. And we can tell Varnish or a CDN or a combination of those, drop everything that you have that contains this. So we really, if something changes, and Drupal knows what changes, um, we can have instant invalidation of everything that just changed by forcing them a refetch of all that content that just changed. And for all the rest, we literally keep everything in cache for maybe a month. We've literally had one external client that implemented this before we can do it on our own hosting platform. And they literally retired 80% of their servers. That's a big saving. Consider using that for your next Drupal 8 site, because you, know, you save some, some cute animals there. Right? Um, so that's all delivery and caches on the front end. Um, the, what is left then? Usually is something in the database, right? Uh, a query of death by a module just you wrote yourself, and admittedly you're not the SQL expert, I'm not a SQL expert. Maybe a colleague is, and you can help you with some performance. Uh, then again, there's also some functionality in Drupal that can really bite you. The most easy way to, to win some database performance, turning off your Drupal database log module. Uh, it's really nice that you have a record of everything that happens in Drupal in your database, because it's there just in the top on the reports, right? Uh, it also is cost you a database write, which are inherently uncacheable and costing you some certain performance if you have a high availability stack like a Career Cloud Enterprise that needs to be replicated as well, will cost you more server resources. If you can just send that to a syslog daemon, which is the standard way of how most Unix servers handle logs, you know, send that to that low-level system, it gets written to a file system, and you're done. Save your lot of performance. Um, keep an eye on table sizes. We, we regularly have clients that exceed sane amounts of table records. There's a colleague of mine laughing a lot about the client that we just had. We won't name them, but they literally had a zillion records in a, in a web form, which they insist contains really vital data. Well, export it and, and clean up the database. Or I literally had a client that had 42 million records of a field revision table of a commerce site. They only should need a handful of records, not 42 million. Clean that up, take a look at those sizes. And, have somebody who's more savvy on database to help you out if you're not the expert on that. Um, check out your indexes. Sometimes you see a slow running query that could really be benefited from just adding a few more indexes here and there between those servers. Um, views is really nice and clickety click yourself a query because that's in essence what it is. It's a query builder. Everything that you do in views ends up being translated as a query to your database. If you combine 15 tables from five different content types and then make them reference everything in between them, you're going to have a slow query on your hands. Sometimes it's really nice for prototyping it. I mean, you can show 
what you need to a client? Is this what you need? Right. And then you go to your SQL savvy colleague or somebody else out there who can rewrite that query in a more performant version that, that you can at least scale and, and spend expensive server resources on something useful. Right. Um, many of these other modules, panels, paragraphs, paragraphs is a big one. <laughs> We've seen a lot of problem, problems with that one as well. So, yeah, check, on, check your show query, query log and see what's going on there. The Vel module also has some nice tools to help you see what's going on with your queries to your database. XDBug as well. New Relic, I sure we didn't mention them. Um, files. In the end, it's all files, right? Or at least something in your model can always be perceived as a file, even though it's actually not. Uh, limit the number of files. I many times see people using, I've had a client that literally had over 50 JavaScript files in his site. Something's wrong there. Drupal itself is a nice mechanism where it says aggregate your JavaScript. You can aggregate style sheets as well. So they all get compacted into one file instead of 50. You win some performance with that. Check that out. Uh, also try to avoid duplication. Sometimes you see, I've seen, I had a client that uses five different versions of jQuery on the same site. Why? Because there were five developers who preferred their own version of jQuery or they had a module that depended on one and then a module that depended on another and they just added it all. You're wasting bandwidth and, and browser resources as well, right? So try to squeeze that into one. And still, you know, tune your images. I sometimes see post stamp size pictures somewhere in a footer that are three megabytes large because that's the pixel format that's running out of these modern digital cameras nowadays. Resize it to a more, a more sensible way. Drupal can help you with that. And then, you know, if you upload it directly to your team directory, you don't have that option. So. And there's so many other things. I could talk for many hours more. I literally have three minutes now, so maybe five, if I extend it a little bit. Use Drush for anything that you can use Drush with. If you don't know what Drush is, find out what Drush is. Mm -hmm. uh, use it at least for Chrome. Uh, Drupal has its own cron mechanism where it literally tries to squeeze all the repetitive scheduled tasks at the end of a normal front end request. So if you happen to be the poor bastard that hits your website just after these things, you know, were indicated as needing some 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 handling, your site is going to slow. Uh, your, your process is going to take a lot more time to complete. It's going to be really inefficient because there's some really maintenance tasks happening as a front end request that you can really do much more efficient by just adding a system task on the level, executing your scrum. It's way more efficient. You know, disable UI modules. If you if if somebody needs uh, views UI on a production site, you're doing something wrong. There's all kinds of presentation on how you can leverage the features module or any other widely known C tools based module to store your changes in views in code, right? So you should not be having that. Views UI is the largest module in Drupal when it comes to code uh, uh, a footprint. So uh, PHP caches, all kinds of memory gets polluted by this. If you can disable it, it's the easiest way to serve, save some memory. Avoid expensive 404. There's a module out there called Search 404 that will literally go to a search engine and search every wrong entry in every URL that it cannot find, it's one way to kill performance. And there's a few more advanced ways. Check out PHP 7. It's really nice. Keep calm whenever you have a performance problem. Try to keep a cool head and see what's really going on instead of making arguments with your sysadmin or your hosting provider. Uh, and try to work together. It's not his fault or their fault or anybody's fault. It's a problem that we all need to fix. Right? This is something that I stole from a government. Um, I don't pretend to know everything about performance. So, uh, do you have some answers or things that I have mentioned? Instead of you asking questions to me, I'm going to ask you. Do you have some recommendations for the rest of the audience? Not really. Oh. 
Ja, Anton knows him. Yeah, actually, knows a lot. one book uh, is rather new to the Drupal 8. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a new capability of opportunities to write the code. Mm -hmm. so, actually, the last night I was used to do that. So it's, a, it's about uh, rendered arrays and cache of rendered rendered arrays. Mm -hmm. Great recommendation. Anybody else? No? Right. Uh, final tips. Don't stop learning. Uh, everything that I said here will be obsolete in a few years. You know, there's new technology coming around the corner. If you know something that somebody else knows, try to have a presentation like I'm trying to do here and educate other people about what you know. Uh, go to conferences, camps, meetups. You can meet some people there. I mean, the girl there, Drupal Camp. DrupalCon in London in 2011, so, you know, there's nice people around here, all right, thank you.